very first Gen 7 race just concluded a few hours ago. It's uh, 1 a.m. right now, so I apologize if I am not in the most uh, zestful uh, mood right now because, well, it's getting late and uh, I want to get this video out before I am caught up doing other sp stuff behind the scenes. So, um, I didn't want to leave you guys hanging, so here's my uh, video, my take, my perspectives, and just... What, overall, what I have to say about the current state of NASCAR and what this is a testament to, this race. Alright, so let's go over what, what happened. Uh, first stage uh, was uh, pretty good. Really, really good. This is what you would expect out of a NASCAR race. Uh, just typical uh, drivers uh, going 3x3, three 2x2, three, two two, going for the lead trying to make their drafting uh, groove work and then of course suddenly a lot of uh, rear bumper hookups just don't go as planned and chaos ensues ultimately that costed Harrison Burton's uh, entry to Cup Series to be an absolute disaster as he tumble tumble tumbled <laughs> Things were really looking up for him, and he looked like he was going to have a car that would compete for the victory and maybe humiliate Matt De Benedetto, which I still think he will absolutely do, because, face it, Matt De Benedetto sucked. And just to make you boomers mad, Bubble Wallace has more Cup Series wins than De Benedumass. Blow me. Face it, he sucked. Own up to it. <laughs> Anyways, I'm getting sidetracked. Uh, fortunately, that also costed uh, Byron pretty damn good in that uh, first big one that I mentioned. And uh, not sure to what cost or what extent uh, this large benefit of the uh, Gen 7 will be. Because uh, at first I didn't think that Denny Hamlin got all that much damage out of the big one. But... When I saw that his suspension alignment was terribly askewed, I realized that there was a lot more damage than meets the eye. And of course, uh, I was really excited to see if whether or not Hendrick Motorsports would achieve another accolade by tying Petty Enterprise for most Daytona 500 victories. Unfortunately, because of the, uh, well, because because we were like basically involved two out of the five big ones that happened in that race, well, two out of the five uh, crashes, whatever, that that uh, chance at us uh, making that tie, making that milestone was gonna just, was unfortunately leveled down into a real shot in the dark if we ever uh, had even a small chance to get back up to the top five pack because, well, Chase Elliott was the only surviving driver on the lead lap, and even then, he was the last driver to finish in the top ten, which I'll take, but of course, it doesn't really mean too, too much, but it's only the start of the season, so we'll have to just take the L on that one. It sucks for Kyle Larson, too, because he just had nowhere to go once on... Um, I think it was, uh, yeah, um, I, I just, sorry, my mind is not in the most, uh, articulative, uh, state of mind right now because I'm just so fucking exhausted from all of that, uh, anxiety that I was going through as soon as I was watching that, when I was watching that race because it just, it just becomes above and beyond anxiety inducing to a point where I just I'm just like oh you all just can't wait for that ten too huh <laughs> well uh, Bowman did at least uh, finish the race but to no avail because uh, he finished three laps down in the 24th position so what do they think of the race overall, well, there was only one instance where 
we had a single file cringe drain, but that was only for a few laps. Like, this race basically was fire and dice. One instance, it, it becomes, it became really boring as fuck, to, like, towards the end of stage two. Of course, that's not without uh, Brad Kizilowski being an utter wrecking ball. Seriously. Brad was so much of a fucking douche that race that he completely eclipsed at any offenses Kyle Busch. Uh, basically would uh, cross the minds of the average individual that would rightfully so hold a grudge against Kyle Busch. Like, I don't know how many lows it would take for one driver to become as much of a douchebag as Kyle Busch, but Brad Kizilowski did seem pretty out there with it. Three whole last times he caused a major wreck. Three whole ass fucking times and people still want to pin the, pin the blame on Chase Elliott for offenses he did that were much 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 far less offensive than what Brad Kizilowski did his single car incidences with other drivers Chase Elliott that is pale in comparison to what we saw out of Brad Kizilowski today Brad Kizilowski was doing a lot worse for a lot less. At least when Chase Elliott's responsible for the crashes he's caused, it was all going for a win. Brad Kizilowski, on the other hand, did it for stage points? Or the Gene gain track position? For more stage points? <laughs> This is the part of the way I am still, to this day, not the most keen on stage racing. At, at least when the cautions come out. But, but can't we just make it less chaos inducing? Maybe at least a little less tedious and less artificial? So that way we won't have drivers that are feel that are feel that feel so compelled to start stupid shit. Just my thoughts, but anyway, who really gives a fuck about my thoughts? Uh, not a big fan of David Reagan, but I gotta give it to the guy uh, avoiding the plethora of wrecks that happened in this Daytona 500 and finishing in the 8th place position, so good for him. Congrats, David Reagan. You got it. You know, uh, if Blaney were to hook uh, Austin Sindrick's rear bumper just a little bit, Bubba Wallace might have had more advantage to edge out Austin Sindrick. But hey, I got to give it to Austin J Sindrick for this one because, well, he really drove his ass off. He uh, did all he could uh, in the lower series to actually warrant a cup ride in Penske. And wouldn't you know... Two consecutive Daytona 500 wins. We have a first-time winner. Michael McDowell last year. Now Austin Sindrick this year. But man, Bubba Wallace came so freaking close. But I am thankful that they didn't penalize Bubba Wallace for going on the yellow line. Because, well, the moment I saw it, I was very skeptical whether or not NASCAR would make ridiculous calls. But luckily... I don't think it even crossed their mind, or at least I hope it didn't cross their mind, because NASCAR for over a decade has been inconsistent with the yellow line. Or maybe more than decades has been inconsistent with this yellow line horseshit. <laughs> like, I get it you want to keep that safety comes first, but if you're enforcing such piddly bullshit... People are going to be too cowardly to race like men for the win. And 2020's Talladega still serves as a testament to that. And I'm still not even close to a Matt Benedetto fan, but that was still bullshit. I call it as I see it, and NASCAR inconsistencies are absolutely notorious. 
to this day. And the late race caution on the final lap on the Xfinity race is, serves as a testament to that because, well, I get it. Listen, I get it. Safety does come first. But when it's the final lap, let me get off, go on a little tangent for a bit. When it's the final lap, all bets are off. You race and race and race for the win. Not to mention the leaders, they're not going to catch up to the wrecked cars on the back straight away. As soon as they cross the line, they're slowing down. There, it's that easy. Just keep it green for the front of the pack, but have the caution come out for the last half of the field. So they won't clobber into halted, damaged race cars. Or destroyed race cars, whatever. It's really that easy. We make these suggestions and NASCAR still wants to overlook them. NASCAR still wants to completely gloss over our compromising and middle ground suggestions. I don't get it. But overall, I will say that this was a great first Gen 7 race. This was not all that boring to me, to be honest. 35 lead changes. There was barely any instance where I felt like, Ugh, can you just change leaders yet? Ugh, I just want some action already. I want someone to do something. I want someone to have the balls to make some pass for positions. Ugh, please, someone have the balls to do fucking something. I don't want to watch this tedious freight train for a hundred plus laps. It's boring. There was never an instance like that. Maybe just for like five laps when they were forming up the single file cringe train around like stage two, but even then, that didn't last too long. At least not for me to get completely sidetracked by other stuff that I would otherwise find more intriguing than a snooze fest from the average 2018 to 2020 era. Or 2008 to 2009 era, or 2015. So yeah, not one of the better days for Hendrick Motorsports, but a great Daytona 500 to watch. I would totally watch it again. Great startup for Gen 7. You definitely are being ushered into a new stock car generation, and I am quite pleased. I can't wait to see how much of my uh, zealousness will be further rejuvenated. As of 2021 being a decent season was an already good enough, I cannot wait what 2022 has to offer in NASCAR season because, well, if this race is how we're going to be ushered into a new generation of stock car racing, I'm all the way in, my dudes. All the way the fuck in. Oh, just to fuel the anger of legitimately racist boomers? Bubba Wallace has more podiums from the Daytona 500 than Matt Benedetto. Don't worry. I'll taste your salt on my McDonald's fries when I get there. Sound great, boomers? You might want to clean up that period blood, Karen. <laughs> All right, I think I said enough. Great Daytona 500. Not that great of a race for my Hendrick boys. Congrats to Austin Sendrick and Bubba Wallace detractors are mad and throwing tantrums at my f facts that I pointed out. Keep it metal, keep it real. Space them out.